Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. Yeah, so I'll say a couple of things on that. One, it is rare for quantitative reasoning questions to give you information that you don't need. Actually, I should be more specific. I'm talking about problem-solving questions as opposed to data sufficiency questions. Data sufficiency questions will give you statements that you don't need, and that's when you'll have an answer choice of A, B, or D. Right? Anytime you choose A, B, or D, in data sufficiency, that means you're claiming that w at least one of the statements isn't needed to solve the question. But in problem solving, you know, when you get a, a word problem on, on the problem solving side of the test, it's pretty rare that they'll give you information that you don't need, but it does happen. I could probably count five to 10 official GMAT questions that I've seen in my career. And I've seen a lot. So, so it is pretty rare, but it does happen. And this is one of those cases where it happens. I mean, they could have just told us that seed mixture X is 40% ryegrass and seed mixture Y is 25% ryegrass and just stop there. There was no need for them to give us, you know, to tell us what the remaining uh, percentages are comprised of. But they chose to do that, I think, in order to increase the difficulty level because it is something that, that can be distracting. Now, if you follow what I always suggest, you probably paused at the semicolon and built a ratio that said uh, for seed mixture X, ryegrass to bluegrass is a ratio of two to three. And then you probably paused again at this period and did the same thing for seed mixture Y. You had a ratio of ryegrass to fescue or fescue, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, uh, that is a ratio of one to three. And if you've really been paying attention, you probably even inserted a third column, what I refer to as the inference column. Uh, and in this case, that would probably be the total, right? So we'd say for X, our ratio is uh, ryegrass to bluegrass to total is two to three to five. And then we'd say for Y, ryegrass to F to total is one to three to four. Now, my hope is that getting this far is not something that would take a very long time for all of you. If you did choose to do this work, which, which I think is a good habit, by the way, I think that it's a good habit when you read the text to build something like this on your scotch paper, and my hope is that it doesn't take very long. Then when you keep reading, what do you notice? They're asking about a mixture of those two seed mixtures. So we're mixing them together, and then they're giving us the percent ryegrass of that mixture. And you have to take a long pause, I think, at the comma to digest and to reflect on what we know and what we want to know. Uh, I mean, the truth is we don't yet know what we want to know because I haven't finished reading the question. I stopped before the word what. But knowing the GMAT, we can probably at this point do some thinking and say, well, I mean, I, I would just ask the following question. Does it even make sense to you that the mixture of X and Y would have 30% ryegrass? Is that even a sensible thing to, to, to say? Can that happen? When you're mixing one seed mixture that's 40% ryegrass with another seed mixture that's 25% ryegrass, is it even possible to get a 30% ryegrass mixture at the end? If so, why would you say that it's possible? And if not, why not? When you're mixing two seed mixtures, they each have, let's call it a property of uh, percent ryegrass, just like uh, alcoholic drinks have a property that's called percent alcohol. And the property of percent ryegrass in the overall mixture has to be somewhere in between the two. And just to give you a little bit more intuition behind that, think about the following. If you end up only using seed mixture X, your percent ryegrass will be 40. If you end up only using seed mixture Y, your percent ryegrass will be 25. As you start bringing in some of the other type of mixture, your percent ryegrass is going to start moving towards that number. 
So you'll end up somewhere in between 25 and 40, and at that point I would expect you to draw a number line and say, okay, on the low end we have 25% ryegrass, that's the, that's the Y side. On the high end we have 40% ryegrass, that's the X side. And we know that in the mixture we're exactly at 30%, which is a bit closer to the left side than it is to the right side. And if I wanted to be a bit more specific, what's the, what's the, what are the distances on either side of 30? Well, we have a distance of 5 to the left of 30 and 10 to the right of 30. That's a ratio of 2 to 1. And who's winning? Right? I want to visually assess who's winning. If this was a tug of war, it looks like Y is winning. So I'm going to put Y on the left, because I always put the winner on the left side. There's the loser. And the ratio is 2 to 1 for a total of 3 ratio units. So that's my big inference that I make at that pause. So if I haven't finished reading the question yet, but I've already made this inference. Now I'm ready to keep reading. What percent of the weight of the mixture, so out of the total mixture, that's, that's this, this column, out of that, what percent is x? So x is this column, so 1 out of 3, what percent is that? What percent is 1 out of 3? Well, that's answer choice B. Absolutely, I think that that's why the GMAT introduced those words that I highlighted here in red. It's, it's in order to distract people from what the important stuff is. It's very similar to what they do in reading comprehension. When they put in a ton of details and then they ask you, what was the author's primary purpose in this passage? And you're so distracted by all the details that you've lost track of why it was that the author wrote this in the first place. And, and you know, uh, let me just say again, uh, I think that starting off with this stuff, which we ended up not using at all, is, is good. I think you should do that because in nine questions out of ten, this will make or break your, your problem. I mean, th this will be a great way to digest the information from that first sentence. So there's nothing wrong with starting with this. In fact, I, I might even say there's something wrong with not starting with this. Like this is the correct place to start in my opinion. But at the same time, you have to keep a, an open mind as you keep reading, right? And, and constantly pause and think. Pause and think, what do I know and what inferences can I make? And based on what I'm reading, what do I think is important and what do I think is a distraction? Because there will be distractions on this test and our job is to avoid getting distracted by them. I think that your strategy was sound. So when I say strategy, I mean your decision to uh, you know, spend a bit more time thinking about this part and trying to predict what further inference you might need to make from there. I think that is a sound strategy. That was perfect. The problem was that you, you did something illegal. You did something you're not allowed to do. What is that? What is the thing that you did that you're not allowed to do? You took two separate ratios. And when, uh, the reason I say separate is because they very likely have different scale factors. Right? You took two separate ratios. That's why I'm coloring them in different colors now. This ratio for seed mixture X has some unknown scale factor, meaning I don't know how much actual quantity of that seed mixture we have. And the same goes for seed mixture Y. I don't know what the quantity is. If you're starting to make inferences across separate ratios, you're making the assumption that they share the same scale factor. That was your mistake. And that's a mistake that could happen in other questions as well. That's why I want to linger on, on that mistake. It would be equivalent to looking at two different maps of North America uh, where those maps have different scale factors. Right? In one map, an inch is 20 miles, and in another map, an inch is 200 miles. Right? And then you start making inferences across those maps by measuring the number of inches from one city to the other, and you'd get inconsistencies. You, you, just, you can't do that because they have different scale factors, and that's what, that was the mistake that you made here. I can't make inferences across different ratios if I don't know what the scale factors are. As long as you can infer that they have the same scale factor, or if they don't have the same scale factor, you can make adjustments to make them have the same scale factor. All right, so for example, if you knew that the amount of x is twice as much as the amount of y, 
then you could take steps to make this number twice as big as this number, whatever steps those would, would look like, right? Like, you know, expanding both ratios by different factors so that this number is twice as big as this number. Then you can say, okay, now I know they have the same scale factor because I know the quantity of X is twice as much as quantity of Y. And indeed, the quantity of X is represented by twice as many ratio units as the quantity of Y. And then you can make inferences across the ratios. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.